the sharing economy, I'm, I'm assuming it is an overlap there with what yeah. you think of as the yeah. sh uh, creative economy. But again, thinking of our audience, how would you explain the rise and the yeah. kind of current situation of the sharing economy in that broader context that you so masterfully laid out? Well, I think that the, the uh, first of all, the uh, big, the, there's several drivers of the sharing economy. There's some good ones and some bad ones. You know, and, uh, and this is why it's again this WTF economy you hear again and again. You know, there's so many wonderful reasons why people participate in the sharing economy. Uh, you know, one of my favorites uh, is a story that my wife uh, heard uh, uh, somewhere in the Midwest of a guy who was a, I believe, a chemical engineer or an aerospace engineer who didn't feel like he got enough human contact at work. And so he would leave early in the morning, two or three hours early for work, and pick up, uh, you know, be, 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 be a Lyft driver and uh, donate the money to charity. Hmm. He didn't need the money, but he wanted the human contact. You know, you hear stories of, of how people who are between jobs or, you know, there's it, a wonderful fill-in aspect of it. People saying, hey, I, you know, I had a lousy job and this is better for me. Or even the, yeah. in the in the home sharing context, is there what's the oh ab well that? absolutely and, you know I, I'm not quite you know certainly there are people who um, uh, you know who do it again purely because they have to they can't make ends meet but there are other people who who for example may have a second home that they want to share mm -hmm. or they're 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 traveling I think of, of my brother actually who who's uh, uh, has found that the, 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 you know, what he can get for his home in Palo Alto is so great that it's an incentive for him and his wife to travel a lot because mm. they actually can pay for the trips oh <laughs> on the rents they're making. They're going to want to just go, you know, that, that's, be away from home. <laughs> you know, so there's, there's a whole lot of, uh, of, of kind of wonderful sort of, uh, you know, interesting stories there. But there's also a profound, um, you know, sense that some of this is rooted in the fact that people don't have enough to get by on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I also see some interesting hopeful signs. For example, that uh, you know, if you look at the competition between Lyft and Uber, you know, one of the focuses of competition is increasingly on who's better to drive for. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. Who's better to drive who's for. Who's better to, to drive for. Yeah. And Lyft has played that, that, that card, I think, uh, very well. I, I think they're, they're a more fundamentally idealistic company. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I also think that that's really a good sign that, that uh, you know, there's a little bit more power. There's mm -hmm. going to be a little more power for labor. You know, over time, you know, for a long time, it was just like people are, are, are uh, you know, coming in. You know, the churn, I think, at uh, 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 these companies is 60% a year. And they go, well, there's always going to be new drivers. Mm -hmm. Well, until there aren't, or mm -hmm. until the quality of the drivers goes down. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that, you know, one of the really interesting loci of competition here, uh, you know, needs to be figuring out how to take uh, driver retention, driver satisfaction into account, as well as consumer satisfaction. Into the, into the algorithm. Itself. Into the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, right now the algorithms are set up uh, to optimize for pickup time. Consumer. Yeah, consumer pickup time. Uh, but just as Google, you know, started out with a, a fairly simple search algorithm and they added more and more factors and it got better and better for a variety of reasons, I think that, uh, you know, Uber could be going, oh, well, actually, you know, driver retention, we'd actually be better if we... Uh, optimize the algorithm uh, for drivers as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the, the, the question though is whether the companies will do that themselves or whether there is a role for government, which has traditionally been you know, kind of the backstop you know, uh, for uh, uh, this kind of thing. Uh, but, or, or, or for that matter, I mean, what are the, the vehicles by which uh, you know, workers get a voice? And, you know, and a seat at the table. I, I love this line from um, David Rolfe at the SEIU. Uh, we were talking and he said to me, you know, God did not make being an auto worker a good job. <laughs> you know, those, those jobs that we look back at in the 60s were the product of a lot of blood, sweat, and tears mm -hmm. by uh, people who, who, you know, amassed worker power mm -hmm. and then used it to get a seat at the table. Now, I, it's funny because I grew up in an era where, you know, the corruption of unions was their dominant, you know, 
face. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I've come to have a great deal more respect for unions mm -hmm. in today's world uh, because, you know, for all the things that are still wrong with them, hey, there's a lot wrong with business too. And it's pretty clear that we, we need a counterbalance mm -hmm. because it is a multiplayer game, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and we need advocates, you know, for, you know, workers. We need advocates for capital. They're pretty good advocates for themselves. Yeah, yeah, but, but we need, you know, and we need advocates for society as a whole. Mm -hmm. But we also kind of need a moral revolution in business. Mm -hmm. A moral revolution that isn't about do-goodism. It's a moral revolution that's about the right way to do things. And what I mean by right, and, and this really kind mm -hmm. of goes back to, to sort of you know, ancient philosophy. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I have an Aristotelian at heart. Mm -hmm. I know that. And, uh, you know, Aristotle described virtue as the control of the appetites by right reason. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that means you've kind of thought this thing through mm -hmm. and you've actually figured out what is the thing that will make you the happiest, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm, and what will make everybody mm -hmm. the happiest. Mm -hmm, and and, mm -hmm. and we actually need to go back to that and realize, oh no, you know, this notion that, you know, simply satisfying the market, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the market, it, mm -hmm. you know, is, is not the right answer. And it's not the right answer for, for a, a really important reason. The, the, the invisible hand market that everybody likes to mm -hmm, think mm -hmm. they're describing you know, is the market of real goods and services, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. where I do something for you mm -hmm. and I trade mm -hmm. it uh, for something that you do and mm -hmm. th th that I want. Mm -hmm. But so much of what we think of as the market today are financial markets, which are a betting pool mm -hmm. about what people might yeah. want. And they're all about perception and the manipulation of perception rather than meeting the real needs of society. Right. And, and so, you know, because those two markets have increasingly diverged, you know, even if you're a, quote, free market fundamentalist, you have to realize that the market that we are living in is, is it, you know, it's distorted by government intervention. It's distorted by, you know, the rules which then corporations play against government, against, yeah. against people. And, and so when I say a moral revolution, I mean a revolution in which we are trying to figure out what really works for sustainability for the long term. Mm -hmm. This sounds like uh, we, we had John Battelle and another Mm -hmm. This what's not for him when he laid out his kind of new co vision, but it's very mm -hmm. similar. Oh, about, yeah, absolutely. Uh, We're traveling on parallel. You paths. guys are, yeah. it's, yeah. Well, it's, but yeah. I think there's yeah. something there, which is why there's something bigger going on here. So, so let's talk about those, those three stakeholders. Um, because what we're talking to in this, which, which should mean, let's say, government, yeah. workers, and business. Uh, now, one thing I'd like to push back uh, to you on, on the um, no, so I actually, uh, uh, or, or, okay, uh, with their very clear that. Well, they're the, the really, the, there's, there's government, there's business, there's workers, there's consumers, oh, yeah. and then there's actually probably a, the fifth one which really needs to be distinguished is financial markets. Because it's super important to remember, if you could drill one thing into everybody's head. I first got this from my friend Bill Janeway. He actually mm -hmm. was talking about what he called a three-player game between government, you know, business, and financial capital. Hmm. But he was the first one who, to my knowledge, at least for me, made the point that that the business, the real business of goods and services and financial capital are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that we've made this huge mistake by using this one term, the market. Yeah, good point. Uh, you know, for, the, for two things which are so very different with very, very, very different incentives. Right. You know, Carl Icahn is doing nothing for the market of real goods and services right. when he buys a bunch of Apple stock. Apple does not need any capital right. from Carl Icahn whatsoever. Right. And yet, somehow, he's managed to extort Apple into doing yeah. share buybacks yeah. you know, rather than lowering prices or, right. you know, um, or giving more, work, more, more to workers uh, because, you know, we, we bought into this you yeah. know, mythology yeah. that feeding the market yeah. is somehow, uh, you know, what keeps everything going. Okay, well you're a player yeah. in the tech circles, business yeah. circles, as well as the venture yeah. circles. What is the mentality in those two? Do you think there's an opening in those two sectors for saying, you know what, um, this isn't right, this isn't, we, we want to do something different, we want to pay more enough for our share, you know, maybe some magnanimous gestures of like, you know what, yeah. uh, you know, let's help drive this rather than just kind of react to the rules that are essentially... You know, I, I don't think that it's, I, I just, I want to stay away from the idea that it's magnanimous. Hmm. You know, um, okay. if, if you think about it, for a long time, and there still are companies that operate this way, 
uh, one of the rules of business was charge as much as you can. Right, mm -hmm. and, or you know, and there's this act sort of the sense of the demand curve. You know, the, mm -hmm. there's a there's a, 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 a magic point at which, uh, you know, the price and the demand are, are in balance. Mm -hmm. But there are companies that you know we see this very much in the government market, but mm -hmm. also in the in, in you know enterprise market in general. Mm -hmm. Companies that are charging way way more than they should for services. Mm -hmm. You know, I think of, of uh, one conversation I had with a city official who was knowledgeable about technology, described a, a, a negotiation with Oracle, mm -hmm. uh, where Oracle came in uh, saying, well, $17 million, and he knew what it should really cost, and he said his counter was a million, and they settled at a million and a half. And the fact that Oracle was asking 17 million for something they were willing to sell a million and a half for you know, is, is a sign of that old mindset, right, that you charge as much as possible. Yet along came a class of companies that said, oh, actually, the way to get business advantage is actually to have prices as low as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, so Walmart, Amazon, mm -hmm. who kind of pushed always for lower prices to increase market share. Uh, and, you know, and so we then went, oh, wait. You know, and of course, and there's a whole market of people who said, well, we can actually do better than that, we'll give away our services for zero and we'll charge someone else mm -hmm. to support our business. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we shifted from a model that said the only way to get ahead is to charge uh, you know, uh, you know, some mm -hmm. kind of uh, you know, monopoly rent higher than, mm -hmm. than, than uh, market price. That's how you get really successful. To one where you said, no, no, charge less. That's how you become really successful. Mm -hmm. And I think we could have a similar point of view that said, oh, you know how you get really successful? Mm -hmm. You know, you pay people enough to afford your products. That actually makes society as a whole richer, and people have more to spend. And there's starting to be a recognition of that. It's that. not magnanimity; yeah. it's common sense. Yeah, I like that. You know, it's and, and you know, and and you look around at all the things that are you know going wrong in society because you know we say, oh, we're paying too much taxes, but you know, so often the people who are you know, complaining the most are paying the least in taxes. Yeah. Actually, I had a, a, a very funny interaction with, with one tech magnate who has never spoken to me since. It was sort of a little Twitter point where he was, I won't mention any names, but he was sort of ranting about, you know, taxes. And I kind of just, on impulse, I went to Yahoo Finance and I kind of looked at his financials and I looked at his competitors' financials uh, and I went, wow, you know, they're all paying an average tax rate of, of you know, high 20s or 30 percent, he's paying 12 percent, mm. you know? And so the guy who's paying the least is complaining the most, that's you know? Wow. And, and, and I, I think that's often, that's often the pattern. Well, but, see, but see, there's a people's feeling is that, oh, the tech folks, that, you know, they're, 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 they won't shift or the VCs won't let go of these insane 10x returns always on the same, you know? There's a kind of a sense like, but you're feeling that there is a shift in mentality happening and there will be a well, kind of a sense well, of... Um, of let me put it this way. First off, um, that is the VC model. And, and I have to say, um, you know, when, when I, you know, look at and when I criticize Wall Street, I criticize the financial players of Silicon Valley just as much. And, and you know, there's, there, for any time someone has a startup for which the principal goal is an exit, mm -hmm. I don't see them as that different from the Wall Street guys who were trying to, you know, package up you know, bad loans and hope that somebody bought them before they blew up. Yeah. You know, there's, a, there's way more of that, of that in Silicon Valley than we admit. Mm -hmm. You know, like to me, the great companies are ones where somebody says, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. I want to do it for a long time. Mm -hmm. I want to make something happen. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you know, you, you see this at a company like, uh, you know, Google or Facebook, where people who are billionaires are still working away at this thing because you know, they weren't trying to get an exit. They were trying to make something happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I think Silicon Valley needs to look in the mirror, uh, you know, particularly in these bubble times. There are a lot of people who never set out to do anything other than, you know, raise money from, you know, from venture capital and then, you know, hopefully at some point flip the company mm -hmm. and then do it again. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, you know, playing, a, 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 again, in the financial roulette markets rather than the real market. Uh, now, that doesn't, you know, th there's obviously a mm -hmm. lot of gray areas in between, you know, mm -hmm. because it can be a useful technique to bootstrap a company to, you know, get something that y you later figure out what the real business model is. Mm -hmm. uh, but, 
But I like to encourage people to really think about, uh, you know, what makes a real business. And that's, uh, you know, why, you know, with our NDVC approach in, uh, at OETV, uh, you know, my venture fund with, with Bryce Roberts, we're really focused on, you know, companies that are looking to achieve positive cash flow because they're actually selling real stuff to real people, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and, and they can be around. And, you know, sure, maybe they're going to have an exit, but they don't depend on an exit. They don't depend right. on just getting another round of financing, selling this company on to some, you know, future bidder. They're building something that should exist. And by the way, there's a great line I saw from Sir Martin Sorrell, who, uh, you know, started WPP, you know, the mm -hmm. world's largest mm -hmm. ad agency, which is, I, I think, uh, uh, I hadn't realized he, that, that WPP stands for Wire and Plastic Products. It's a wow. shell company that they bought, he, you know, he bought, and he put 375 thousand dollars of his own money and to buy it huh. originally and he's built this thing up to be what you know this you know huge multi-billion dollar business you know it's a small amount of but he had this great line he said uh, uh, being an entrepreneur means risking your own money not someone else's hmm? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> great.